thank you all and good evening i hope you all had your cups of tea and are energized and will be able to ask the ambassador uh, some uh, tough questions um i was telling them that i'm you know the environment is not necessarily my domain area of exp expertise or experience but diplomacy is i've been reporting on indian diplomacy for the better part of my journalistic career and so i guess this is an area where journalism and diplomacy might actually come together on stage so thank you ambassador for actually give, for giving uh, this time that you have this evening our conversation really is about um you know i want to flip it around and say it's it's about the environment how the environment is reported upon but also the media environment that we inhabit today i think we can sort of play on that word a little bit so before we go into the nitty gritties of your career as a journalist before you were a diplomat as well <laughs> tell us what your um observations are about the global media environment right now well that was a very big uh, question to <laughs> the, and i think I, i think it's very difficult to 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 answer it also because i don't think it is one one uh, answer but uh, if i and this will of course just be a layman view my feeling is that you have strong uh fact based medias and i don't think that has been been weakened that see here in india also but you have much more also of this very noisy uh kind of entertainment uh, mm -hmm. kind of media but you know there is a, i i technically i'm a historian by education and when you, and when i wrote my thesis i was uh, reading lots of old newspapers and you know the many years back that was really when it was quality you know that's that's the the the, the lost childhood but it wasn't hmm. i would say my my in 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 general the good newspapers today for instance good, good tv channels today are in many ways better than many of them were at, at that time but you know it's a it's a bigger educated uh, uh, audience hmm. also you can talk to so you so th there is <coughs> more space for that kind of thing but it's probably on the other hand the the the, the very noisy uninformed uh, sensation driven uh, media it probably has a much bigger place than before but uh, I, I, it's it's not like kind of media suddenly has lost this innocence and so is that the same case in norway as well yeah i, I would say the, uh, that that's the case although i uh, I will will maybe s say that there are some elements which I see in some other uh, for instance the the kind of TV debates and where you have 10 people talking over each other and so forth that's unknown to us I, I will say that's unknown to you yeah all right so welcome to India I suppose uh, you know given that you said that's unknown to you but let's just move on a little bit into uh, the area we're really here to talk about today which is also uh, reporting that you have done uh, first of all tell us about your career as a journalist or your days as a journalist and why you decided to move from that into diplomacy I <laughs> I didn't actually know that I had on my CV at all that I had worked as a journalist so that <laughs> Oh you did some reporting right yeah No I I I actually worked at the university newspaper and I also <laughs> uh wrote uh, sketches for for uh, uh, for for the national broadcasting uh, for uh, for, a, for a while so that was more and my writing was more commentary and things like that but I was I had the choice when I finished university I was offered a job as a news journalist and uh, well in the end I ended up in a, on the in other the, side the, yeah on the other side um on the issue of the environment and reporting on areas that are not necessarily uh, you know day to day politics and politicking perhaps um we tend to find that uh, news about the environment uh, often only makes it to the headlines the front pages when there is the threat of imminent disaster or something has taken place that's grave and demands um public attention otherwise given the fact that global conversations around climate change the paris agreement um uh, global warming new technologies clean energy things like that are you know they're part of 
conversation in day to day discourse but they don't make it to media attention do you have a view on why that is I, th I think this is the the problem uh, for any any journalist in in, in a way uh, to to deal with issues. If you take climate change, which may be the most important challenge we have in this century, mm -hmm. uh, but you you know you're talking about threats which are 20, 30, 40 years ahead, and to sell the urgency of that that I that is very d uh, difficult. That's the same problem for for the politicians in 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 a way, you know also for politicians to 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 prepare policies which are you know give give effect maybe of 10 15 years long time after your, your election period is over that's that's difficult that's challenging that's a very brave politician who 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 does that and i i think that's the challenge for the media also having said that i i think in many ways <coughs> if i look globally on it Media has been been uh, active and played an important role in getting the fact that there is, in most countries, an acceptance mm -hmm. that climate change is real yeah. and and that it is uh, important. But it is also, as Al Gore called his film about the climate change, it's an inconvenient truth yeah. Yeah. because if we are going to be effectively combating climate change, we have to make changes which actually affects our yeah. lives and you know it's very difficult for many of us to uh, uh, do something which may be have not have which is inconvenient travel less us, plane, yeah. less planes uh, play, uh, not using private cars whatever uh, when uh, this change again it doesn't really matter for today it's the way it's for we the think. future yeah so yeah but I think, uh, you know, when we talk about looking at the future, no mm. politician really wants to put his career, today's career on the line for something that may be un seemingly unpopular or lose him or her votes today for a future mm. good. That's one part of the story. The other part is in international negotiations or international coverage when uh, the sort of world media community talks about issues like this, um, We've seen how negotiations, whether it's at the WTO, whether it's over the Paris uh, Agreement, things like that, where developing nations have a particular view and the developed world has one view. So historic responsibility, the issue of historic responsibility. How can the challenges that poses to diplomacy be reconciled with the needs of developing nations, the economic needs, the developmental needs, the technology needs? And how does that get um, represented or reflected in the writing or journalistic discourse about this? Well, uh, again, this is uh, first, it's both interesting and challenging to write about this because complex issues mm -hmm. are difficult to popularize. That, that, that's that's uh, one thing uh, about it. And, and often with, you know, what is the most efficient policies? Where should we start? Where should we use our resources? Uh, that that uh, unfortunately there are no easy answers they're not you see you do this and this and that will have no right. effect whatsoever i mean we have an interesting situation just in in norway no, uh, and you have it many other countries uh, also but but for instance clearly we need to 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 produce more uh, renewables although uh, norway itself is ha lucky because we get 98% of our electricity from uh, hydropower, but we are building big windmills also for exporting to to the to the rest of the continent. That is very important if we are going to combat climate change. At the same time, what we have seen, we have seen uh, F, uh, uh, lots of protests locally about this because again it clashes again. The, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a focus on, for instance, trying to preserve nature, hmm. which is very, has always been very strong in Norway and also been one of the reasons why we came early out focusing on, for instance, on climate change. But here you are then in the situation that this is a very efficient rem remedy long term, but at the same time, you pay a price for it. It, it is not free, and I mean it. And it, you can come with the same argument when you, when when it comes to the international 
negotiations, for instance, about finding uh, uh, when it comes to situation between uh, developing and, and developed uh, countries. And I, uh, I think what is what is important here is again to 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 focus on on some of the contradictions. If you look at at for instance, if you compare Norway and India on, mm -hmm. on this issue, in, if you go by IEA figures, uh, the highest share of the energy demand, growth of the, the energy demand globally over the next 30 years will come from India. So clearly, <coughs> whether we are going to succeed in, in reducing the effects on climate change, it's dependent on uh, India um, succeeding. You can say India and China together, and that's really the, the key. While, while for instance, a, a, a country like Norway, 0.4% of world population or even less than that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in itself doesn't make any, any change at all. Uh, but what we try to do also in our cooperation, for instance, with India, where, where this is one of the are areas where we are focusing, is actually that we can be, we, uh, being a highly developed country, we can be a laboratory. We can afford to make mistakes, try out technologies, and 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 learn from that. And so, from that point of view, uh, some of our experiences can then be exported here instead, without the mistakes mm -hmm. which you you do. Take a uh, well, take it uh, an example as, for instance, electric vehicles. I mean, we have the biggest share of electric right. vehicles anywhere in the world. We don't produce uh, the cars. Actually, we did, but started too early, so there was no market for it. So that, <laughs> that broke. But, uh, but what we have is that we have a lot of experience on how do you get people to buy it, but basically also <laughs> how do you buy infrastructure for it, and what are people as consumers, what what do they need to do for, for changing, for instance, from one to the other? So that's, uh, and what kind of legislations do we need to have? What kind of changes do we have? So that kind of, of, of experience can then be exported here. While we, as you always have, if you, if you have the first mover on a new technology, yeah. we have paid a very high price in, in one way for, for succeeding with this, this policy, but that's okay, kind of. And yet, when it comes to the question of sharing technologies or uh, passing them on to countries like India and China, mm. which mm. are now the lion's share of mm. the population, of industry, of manufacturing, uh, things like that, you know, global uh, regimes, technology sharing regimes, trade regimes, things like that become or to have become uh, sort of blocked because of the different views and different demands from these two these two countries in particular from China and India in particular as well in mm. the past we saw that it took a, a fair amount of deft diploma diplomacy and negotiation at the Paris uh, agreement mm. for example when India actually went ahead and said all right fine we sign on to uh, certain uh, certain parts of it, but then you have a U.S. president who walks in and says America is walking out of this. Climate change doesn't exist, and a country like India is saying, "Well, you forced this country with all its developmental needs to sign on to an agreement where the lead country is now walking out of it." So, how do countries like Norway then deal with that kind of drama in diplomacy, really, when it comes to these critical issues? Well, when, uh, uh, in diplomacy and hopefully in life, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> also, if you face a problem like that, you, you see how you can work around it. Because I, 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 I think for the first thing, you, you are in a situation, if you look at from, from India's point of view also, mm -hmm. India is one of the countries which will pay the highest price if, if you are not succeeding right. with it. So it, it's about the India's future also. So it is a one-to-one -one relationship. The second thing is then, then that even if you have United States going out, it's possible to, to, for instance, for others to be the norm setters. And for instance, when it comes to trade, you see just after uh, America pulled out of, of the agreement, you got 300 big companies in in United States, you had state of California and so forth, who said that they would be acting according to 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 this agreement. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can also build international agreements in such a way 
that these things are taken into consideration. Trade agreements, for instance, some of the some of the things where, for instance, developing countries are reacted when it comes to WTO is standards. But standards can work both ways. Right. So 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 you have to you have to be flexible on 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 this thing. And I and I don't think uh, in the long run that the Americans either will be free uh, free riders on on a system like this. But I come back to the question of historic responsibility as well. Understood that you know population uh, imperatives are very different in the developed world versus the developing world right now in these two countries. But how do you foresee uh, countries like India going forward and adopting regimes or technologies that might actually fit into a global um, sort of compact, uh, so to speak, on preserving the environment, on making sure that we don't cross over that two degree uh, window as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, where, will, where do you see that happening? Can we leapfrog on technologies? Can we do that? I mean, what is what is your solution inside? Yeah, no, I, I think part, well, first thing I think is what you should continue what you did in Paris in the in the way that because much of the criticism against India sometimes in international organization hmm. is that India's uh, preferred to stand a bit on the sideline criticizing. What India did in in Paris was to try to take uh, uh, be among the leaders on framing. This the, thing, and yeah. I think that's very important to be ambitious in framing the the whole discussion. And in, India has the heft; it has the uh, to to be able to do that, and understanding to be able to do that. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, yes, I, I think also these huge changes uh, we uh, we are facing now they represent uh, big uh, opportunities for technology shift. We are. Just to take one, 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 uh, one example, we have research program together with the Indian uh, institutions when it comes to finding more environmentally fr friendly uh, air conditioners. And but just, is this important for India? Well, it's important because only 7% of Indian families uh, have air conditioners today. And we know that when people move into the middle class, the first thing many of them buy is an, is an air conditioner. So just think about it. If we are able to succeed uh, with that, what what kind of impact that will have? And so this is also the fact that the 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 needs are so strong. Uh, all also should be a driver for change of technology. And I think it's important to 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 see that in in uh, I mean basically. There have been lots of bad news when it comes to to, uh, to, uh, to the climate change happening maybe faster than than yeah. expected. And, and I mean, Norway is one of the places we see it the most. Up in the north, the yeah. change is much faster than than, much, yeah. uh, than 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 other other places. But at uh, but at the same time, we have uh, all also seen that. Take for instance solar power. Mm -hmm. I mean, the price of so uh, or renewables. Today, compared to whatever five years ago, has been a massive change, uh, which also means that that uh, a number of the prognosis for how, uh, or for instance, consumption patterns would develop, have uh, have turned out to be uh, too pessimistic. Doesn't mean that I, this will not be very challenging still, because. Um, with all the prognosis, now the demand for oil and gas will continue to grow mm -hmm. to 2040. Mm -hmm. uh, but it shows that there are possible uh, uh, big possibilities in making right. leaps of changes mm -hmm. when it comes to development and technology. And it's very difficult to see that part of the, solu uh, the uh, a, a solution where, where, where improved technology is not an important mm. part of that. So, you know, given that fact that we're, we're talking about the challenges mm. going forward. Um, and when we as journalists approach a story, the challenges are what become the lead, they become mm. the, the headline, whether it's diplomatic challenges, whether it's uh, developmental challenges, whether it's price and trade challenges, whatever it might be. But the, the need to overcome that hump. Now, in, in India, um, and since you talked about 
you know, how India took the lead uh, in, the, in the Paris negotiations as well, because it had a view it wanted to ensure was heard on the world stage, even if that was an unpopular view globally. Um, we're in, an, in a strange age of politics as well. Um, so where is the linkage or the interlinkage or the intersectionality between populist politics, um, rule of law, and issues that impact citizenry, like, like challenges to the environment, like climate change? And I'll give you an example of why I'm asking this question. Um, I think it was in today's uh, newspaper in Delhi where there is a missive from the Delhi government saying that they're going to slash or give free power uh, to people who use less than a certain amount of power every month in their homes. Somebody has to pay for that free power. It may not be the person who's consuming it, but somebody is making that payment. So I think the idea that resources are not infinite, that they cost money, um, gets lost because po politicians want to win elections as well. Uh, that, that, that's true, but I, I, uh, I just read quickly this uh, story on, 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 on New Delhi, but, but you, 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 could, you could see a situation where you could give some free electricity for a, for a minimum and the others pay more. Hmm. Uh, but, but clearly you would have to, on the, on the one hand, uh, electricity is a, is a common good. On the other hand, if you are not able to increase the prices on it, because that's the most efficient way we have to try to limit uh, the usage. So, so but I, I, you know, I'm not ready to kind of say one thing but or the in, other about in the, that. The principle model. in yeah. general, I mean, whether it's about water, whether it's, I mean, yeah. people assume that water is a free public good, yeah. but water is drying up across the globe. Yeah. Um, so how do we go about trying to conserve water? We talk about air pollution in a city like mm. Delhi, you know, and what that's mm. doing to temperatures, what that's mm. doing to the air we breathe, to our health. And yet, come Diwali every year, when there is a chorus of people speaking out about firecrackers, for mm. example, you'll have another lot of people who say, why are you questioning the use of firecrackers? It's to celebrate a festival. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not batting for either side. I'm just simply saying that when, when the political climate is so divided, then even an issue that requires people to come together mm -hmm. is prone to falling victim to that, that kind of division. Uh, that's true, but that, that's where also me media has a, a, a responsibility in setting the agenda. What is, because journalists can decide what is important, what should be on the front page, what should be the first first is issue on, on, on the news. I mean, because that's basically why, why we prefer the edited media to, to just social media, mm -hmm. is actually that they have a view on what is important and not important. And let me take something which I have thought have been encouraging here in India then since you mentioned water. Mm -hmm. I mean, the water scarcity, clearly you need to have policy changes there. Clearly, it's a common good you will have to pay for one way or another. Otherwise, uh, you know, you will grow sugar cane where you never should grow sugar cane rice where you don't do that. But here you have a situation where Niti Yog being a think tank for the government makes thoroughly studies and looking forward, forward planning. And the media, I think, has been very good when we got the droughts coming on actually to, to, to writing long articles where they try to, and having uh, things on the TV where they try to explain to us commoners, what are, what the are the challenges and how can it be dealt with? Well, to move from there to make uh, policy changes, that's of course a good step, but to establish the kind of recognition that that actually is important, that's a key. It's like with, if you took it climate change. Yeah. I know it's still, in some countries it's, it's uh, disputed, but generally in most countries would say that this is happening. And how did they do that? I think it was a very good way because the governments decided instead of diplomats like me who can only we are you know have very superficial knowledge about very many things bring in you, the experts you bring in the expert you bring in experts from all over the world and they come up with recommendations which we today say common say 97% yeah. consensus on right. something so you have a you establish the fact base you you have established then and 
then it is, among others, for, for media also to co try to convey those things. So we have about five minutes left. I'm going to take some questions, but I want to just leave you with a thought before we go to the questions. You made that point about edited media and why you prefer it. Uh, edited media today is all often taking cues from social media. So while you will have uh, an opinion piece talk about the need for saving the environment or what kind of steps can be taken on an issue like pollution, for example, you'll have another voice on the same page, sort of a for and against. And I don't know whether that kind of false equivalency that's being created is really, you know, I mean, that's a question the media needs to ask itself, I think, taking on from your point. But uh, a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah. I was just, uh, I think this is a question for uh, the way the media sort of chooses its stories. Uh, I like the, the edited media point that the ambassador just made. I'm going to use that line henceforth. You uh, and a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I represent a think tank and uh, I'm very keen to understand and we work, uh, as you know, uh, with climate, energy and resources. Um, what is it that we need to say better? the experts need to say better, and uh, what should we say so that uh, most of these conversations, which actually affect a lot of us, but is still not mainstream. I mean, you talked about mainstream and you talked about negotiations, which is very far from people's lives, whereas electricity is very close to our lives. Uh, what should experts and media sort of get into a huddle and discuss so uh, climate change and energy use uh, becomes a little more mainstream? It's open to both of you. I think I'll let the ambassador try and take that question. Well, I, I'll get into trouble if uh, I try and answer it. <laughs> I think that actually it's your question because <laughs> I, I have wondered often about the same thing. I mean, when we as government uh, come up with policies we think are very important to, to, to convey on positions like, uh, like this, uh, it's very often very difficult to get media to... to, to to, to take it, and you, you often ask the question, what, 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 why isn't this important? Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I must say that I, I full heartedly follow your thinking, but I unfortunately, if I had had the, the answer, I would have been much more efficient in putting forward uh, our, our positions on a number of things for, or to the media. I think, I mean, if you want me to just take that uh, for a minute, I, the, the, the real challenge really is, I mean, I was lucky to work in a news organization that prioritized a lot of other news apart from just political news. But I see that shift taking place even in that organization today. And I think that's driven by the revenue model that most media houses are uh, victim to. And I think there is, a, there is a dire need within the media industry to reevaluate revenue models. We come from, and since you and I are from the same school and had the same teachers, I know you agree with me, we come from a school of thought that said journalism is a public good. We're actually doing something which creates awareness, which spreads information, which highlights injustice. Uh, I think that definition of journalism needs to be re um, emphasized, recalibrated, and working with a revenue model where that is not compromised. I think that's a big challenge. I don't have the answer. I'm just telling you that my, that's my identification of the problem. Uh, any other questions? I, mean, I just wanted to ask you because, of course, you've had, your country has been obviously at the forefront of uh, such issues uh, of climate change. But largely uh, amongst the Norwegian public, what is the view about India's large energy demands. I'm sure you have uh, addressed this question, but if you could reiterate on, uh, in, in simpler terms, on what is the public perception amongst your countrymen about India's huge energy needs and its uh, requirement to, you know, um, fulfill its, um, the, or, or try to reach the place where you've already reached in terms of development? Well, I, if I should be perfectly frank, I think most of them don't know much about it. That's that's uh, that's a, a kind of of uh, the reality. In in fact, in spite of the fact that I would say that we have more foreign news, uh, maybe in Norway than many other places. But what I register when I come home in the vacations is that it 
it may be because I'm getting older. I have, I have the feeling that it's less foreign news uh, than it used to do so, uh, be. So I, I, I would say that there is a general feeling that 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 it's very important that the, the developed <laughs> world is uh, helping the developed world, be, uh, uh, developing world, because it's. Uh, uh, Climate change as a, a challenge is very well established in Norway, and that's uh, what we also see, and that you see in parts of, of Europe just this year, is that, for instance, green parties are, are getting much more support uh, than they've had before. Yeah. So, so, and that's a very interesting development, and we have seen just the last year that that change has been there. But, you know, it's an interesting thing also with, with, with this just, to, to show that this is difficult, because Norway, for instance, spends lots of money on on uh, trying to combat climate change, developing alternative technologies, for instance. Um, on um, we, are, we are trying to find systems where you can uh, clean CO2 out of and then put it down in, in the soil. I mean, we have spent a couple of, of uh, billion dollars on on these experiments which still we haven't been able to develop the the technology and all these things but you have we have ambitious goals on um, on uh, reducing our own emissions over over the next 20 30 years but they are very costly for every kilo of co2 we reduce if we wanted to have some kind of you you know a uh, if we should have maximum Effect. We should send all of the the money uh, to uh, send a big check to to India and said, please use this smartly on on climate mm -hmm. uh, change because we would get much more out of it. So you know it's a difficult balancing point. But in, if we did that, we would not be able to achieve our own own uh, own goal. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, so you, so I'm in a situation there are not clear answers. We see very clearly the needs. We see clearly, for instance, a country like India, where you have very low um, energy usage per capita compared to others. So you will have a big big growth. And clearly, uh, it's, it's unfair if, if, uh, if India, in some ways, because the rest of us have spent up more, most of the kind of what is available space for CO2 two emissions. So it is important to find models uh, where, where we can assist uh, India. But I think realistically, the way the situation is, economic situation in many countries and so forth, is that that can only be, uh, economic support can only be a part of it. More important will probably be, for instance, to 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 assist in developing technologies and 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 so forth. Because I think realistically, when we see how things develop, no, I mean, technology development is very important, and then maybe also focusing on some of the technologies which are very important also for 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 instance energy uses here. Right. And that, I think that also kind of goes back to the question of historic responsibility and developmental needs of the developing world that I was asking about earlier. Yeah, but scalability. scalability, that's right, that's yeah. right. Can we take one more question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, so this is more from a social perspective. Yeah. Are your younger people in Norway more invested in making uh, alternate, more sustainable choices? And is there a campaign that you all have run that you could share with us? Yeah, I, I clearly think that uh, I, I don't know when I look at polls and, and things like that, and I I, uh, I don't see a big uh, change between the generations. But what we have seen lately is we have had big mobilizations in lots of of, uh, of countries in Europe. You have had uh, day strike against uh, among, among school students against climate change. Um, we have seen, for instance, uh, this. Greta Thunberg, this Swedish kid of 15, 16 year old, who has become a a a, a icon for 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 the for the movement. So at the time being, clearly there is a, is a move. But I'm a bit careful in in one way to to kind of conclude on that because very many of these kind of movements among your young people, as we know ourselves from uh, way back. They have a tendency to fizzle out sometimes. Hopefully, this is not one of, one of those where, where it is 
fizzling out. And we can see when it comes to party preferences, for instance, if you look at there, they have a tendency to vote more with the, with the Greens and, 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 and so forth. But how sustainable the, this development is, I don't know. And I, that also reflects something else. And this is a more broader co uh, comment in democracies, is that what we see is that political tendencies are much less stable today than they, yeah. they used to be. The, the divisions in society and so forth is, are also changing. So I, I hesitate a bit to be kind of too, to, to draw too strong conclusions uh, about it. Also, I think the political tendencies thrive on these divisions and politicians thrive on these divisions. And those that's a whole different conversation, I think. Uh, I wish we had time to, do, to have that conversation as well. But thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for coming to the Media Rumble and speaking to this group. Thanks a lot.